So I've been lucky enough to get to some pretty remote coral locations in around the world. And pretty much every coral location, even very remote ones that I've seen, um, uh, and this is a also secondhand knowledge about places like uh, um, Minerva Reef out in the middle of the of uh, the ocean as people are heading to Fiji and, and the like. Um, they all are affected directly by humans as far as I've seen and um, not just by global warming or, temp or sea temperature uh, changes or uh, any of the, of the indirect effects but in fact uh, was, you find pollution and, and broken off bits of coral and things like that from anchor strikes in the most remote places. Um, so these things are fragile and we have to remember that not that they don't only build reefs by themselves but are they're, they're, um, they're building it in partnership with all of these things like these algae and other organisms that are living there. And uh, when you damage these things so then you're also taking away all of the homes for the and uh, space for things like photosynthetic algae like the um, uh, zooxanthellae that live within the, the structure. So I imagine if you walked across this reef you'd probably find that, that you that um, uh, it'd be pretty visible where you'd walked because these structures are are fairly um, are fairly uh, fragile even though they can take a lot of wave energy uh, depending on their on their type but um, you'd probably be able to see where you where you damage the coral and every time you break this off and reduce the uh, complexity of it, then that's taking away some of the ability to um, have primary productivity. Now, luckily, these things can grow very fast when they're and fill up that space. As you can see, these plate corals, what are they doing? They're competing for um, a, a, for access to light for their zones and belly to make energy. And they can grow quickly if they are damaged, uh, as long as the conditions are correct. Um, but you have to, you can, you can also imagine that as these pieces broke, break away in a wave or they've been damaged somehow or um, any way that the reef might be impacted, then they fall down to the bottom and then there are things like the um, well, hermatypic corals are the ones that are built reef building, uh, but they're not doing it on their own. There are also things like the encrusting algae you can see here that glue all those pieces together and uh, grow over it. And you'll often find lots of this. It's a lot like our uh, pink coralline paint that we have here. Um, but you'll find that these uh, these are very common in the fore reef where there's a lot of wave energy. And you can think of it like a, a pavement where all these bits are stuck together by this stuff. Uh, the coral, um, this uh, coralline stuff that um, and that allows it to be quite resistant to being washed away the chunks aren't just washed down into the deeps of the fore reef some of them are but uh, a lot of them are stuck together and give a platform for new corals to grow um, so we also have this halamita green algae that um, has a lot of uh, uh, calcium carbonate crystals that grow on the top so you can imagine if you're a uh, grazer um, they uh, and you come and have a bite of that it's pretty hard chewing up a mouthful of, of rock and even if you are a parrot fish or something like that that will eat this then it's adds a lot more bulk to the digestive system that you're not getting that you need to spend energy to process but you don't get any um, energy return out of so it makes it a little less attractive for grazers um, and when that all breaks down uh, that also contributes as we've said um, coralline algae are probably a little bit more uh, important in pacific reefs than atlantic reefs uh, they are um, it's interesting when you think about it because the the atlantic reefs are really not much older than the last ice age. So 15 to 20,000 years are when the Atlantic reefs, or how long the Atlantic reefs have really had in order to uh, 
uh, to grow, there would have been a few refugia. But uh, so you can imagine why they're they're quite a bit less diverse. They haven't had as much time to to uh, to exist and uh, speciate, radiate into different niches. Uh, so uh, yeah, we'll see that there's more diversity and uh, more of an effect of these things uh, cementing together old structures in the Pacific. So we don't only have things growing and um, making the reefs bigger, but we also have uh, things like uh, these bioeroders. So just look at the teeth on this thing. Uh, that's a parrotfish. And if you go, when you go diving in the uh, tropics, you'll hear this crunch, crunch, crunch. You'll hear the sounds of it, um, of these things just crunching away at the at the reef pretty much all day there's uh like just a sort of a crackle in the in the water that you hear constantly and these things um they can nip off bits of coral and grind it up and um if you watch them in the morning they're grinding away and in the afternoon you'll see like um uh these things swimming around and we saw that cloud of um of poo coming out of these their rear ends and uh, you'll see that it's, it's huge amounts, it's large volumes of poo, and it's white. It's not like a black colored poo because a good portion of it is just ground up um, bits of coral that uh, come out as sand. And uh, so that's quite important, really. Um, if you're on a white sand beach in, in the tropics, you're probably standing for the, um, for the most part on parrotfish poo. Uh, and then we also have things like uh, urchins, which um, they eat the algae that settles onto the uh, onto the the reefs, and the, the parrotfish as well. They're not just biting off coral and stuff; they're also grinding away like the um, algae that's growing on uh, on little bits of rock and things like that that have settled down. And same with the urchins; they're um, things that are living in the reef, and the, all the little holes and everything that are created by all this by our erosion actually increase diversity by creating other niches for the little little creepy crawlies to live in so urchins are um, very diverse and very common on coral reefs uh, very um, important to kind of keep them keep your hands away they're not like arcana where you can pick one up the little they're little hypodermic needles and uh, woe to you if you try to pick them up with um, with bare hands but yeah, they're actively breaking down the reef. There are bio eroders that are, uh, it's not just biogenic building, but also biogenic eroding of reefs. Okay, we won't spend too much time on this slide. This essentially is what we're gonna be doing over the next uh, few slides. But um, if you look at this one, in a week talk, which has had uh, quite a bit of nuclear testing on it uh, back in the Cold War days, uh, 60 million years old so that's a very very old old reef um, so as I mentioned before in the Atlantic there are maybe only 10 to 15 thousand years of, of uh, growth but there's a lot of time for speciation speciation and um, uh, buildup of, of coral over that time it's a very interesting place I'd love to get there one day hopefully you will as well we're going to start talking about the different types of reefs, how they form, and we're going to look at three different types of reefs. We're looking at fringing, barrier, and atoll. What you want to remember is that anywhere like a little, a little larva can swim in and settle, and it's shallow enough so that it's got light, it can live its life, build up a, a calcium carbonate skeleton, and then dies, and then other uh, corals settle on it, then eventually, with enough time, uh, that um, becomes a coral reef structure, like a whole the whole environment. And um, so we start with a fringing reef, which is where there's a land, a bit of land mass. Then those uh, algae can, or those sorry, not algae, those um, larvae. Of the coral can come in and settle next to the landmass. It's shallow, there's plenty of light, and it may be, uh, um, uh, it 
may be turbid, it may be clear water, there may be a lot of wave action, but in, in any case, they will find a place to settle and they grow and they just grow around the edge of the, of the land structure. Okay, so the second type of uh, reef is a barrier reef. So these parallel the coast and these are ones out here where uh, the, probably it was at one time um, shallow enough that uh, deeper water corals could settle and just make their way with uh, a little bit of light and then like very, given a lot, enough time these, these um, coral structures built up and uh, they're off the, the coast a little bit, uh, they're parallel to the coast there would have been where the it tends to drop off into deeper water but um shallow enough there that the structure that the corals could start to form and they are great buffers and they build so behind the reef there's a big lagoon which is uh tends to be much much calmer water and um they are also uh break a lot of the big wave energy and make the uh, the land much more hospitable, uh, let much less um, variable, less less uh, um, susceptible to typhoons and uh, giant storms and tsunamis and things like that. And they can be uh, giant, like 1,500 kilometers long, which is the Great Barrier Reef, uh, which is the largest biogenic structure on the planet. That is called a barrier reef. And then finally, we have the atoll. Okay, so these were fringing reefs, um, and the land mass, due to tectonic movement, uh, has sunk away. And yet, the uh, in the middle, but the um, coral growth has kept up with, has been fast enough to keep up with the sinking rate of the of the land mass and so the coral atoll just remains even though the land has sunk away so yeah 12 um 1200 kilometers uh largest 1200 kilometers wide in the marshall islands uh 50 million actually 60 million years old in you know what took and um up to 1.4 kilometers deep so they can go very very deep based on the old land mass that was that has sunk away so that's um quite incredible and they're amazing places you've got this beautiful lagoon in the center uh and often they'll have a passage through that you can bring a boat in um it can be like massive heavy currents that go in in and out of these passages but uh, really amazing places, and hopefully you get a chance to get to some um, tolls over the course of your life. So let's talk a bit about the structure of a fringing reef. We'll do the talk about the first type of reef, a fringing reef. Um, you start at shore. Often this area can have mangroves or uh, palms and things like that people sometimes build houses like pole houses and things right out even onto the onto this uh, reef flat right over the shoreline usually often sand but sometimes very steep um, uh, lots and lots of different shore morphologies but usually there's a bit of a reef flat right here and that's kind of what we were mentioning before where there's it's very important to local people there's a lot of uh they're, they're shallow it can be weighted and lots and lots of food can be gleaned off of those uh those shallow flats um they're usually made up of they could be mud they could be sand they could be coral rubble um but uh they're a little bit more susceptible to freshwater inputs and uh they can often have uh, um, like eelgrass like seagrass meadows so you can get things like turtles and things um munching in there uh more variation in temperature up in this area because uh, if they're shallow it can get very hot during the middle of the day and then cool off at night when the 
uh, there'll be more of a flushing effect through the tidal cycles, but um, there's not as much water movement, of course, on the reef flat. And um, so then you, so you get a little less variety, a little less um, uh, because of that um, variability in the water quality, uh, if you're getting sediment and that kind of thing, or uh, temperature variety and um, exposure then you're probably going to get a little less your diversity with the uh, within the reef flat a lot of things that are specialized for that area um, fresh water uh, can not necessarily corals don't necessarily do very well with a lot of fresh water or most corals anyway so you're gonna have you're gonna find that there is an area that doesn't tend to have a lot of uh, coral, um, but is got a lot of uh, sand and the like, and all, it's a really nice place to be because there are a lot of fish cruising around and little small reef sharks and things like that cruising around and hunting in the reef flat. Uh, at low tide, probably exposed to air, and so then we move down to the reef crest, okay, and uh, you can see where all this this is kind of the limestone of the reef is built up over the the land area. This was the actual land, but you'll get this buildup of, of limestone, which um, acts as a bit of a buffer for wave action coming in close to the shore. But at the reef crest, anyway, and kind of in here, and you'll see it's it starts to drop away, air, uh, quite a bit more diversity. Um, the corals aren't exposed to open air at low tide and lots of light uh, lots of wave action so we get uh, lots of different abiotic factors that are uh, shaping the morphology and the types of um, corals and the diversity of corals that uh, are appear here and then we'll have the outer reef where it starts to drop away and it gets deeper you can start to lose the the corals as you get to it down to a certain depth depending on the turbidity of the water uh, the light availability makes a big difference in terms of uh, how much uh, how deep these corals will go uh, you'll get coral rubble falling down the slope and collecting at the bottom you can get um, uh, a big band of sponge gar with sponge gardens where you start to lose the light but great diversity of sponges um, and interesting fish life uh, living down as you move down into the deeper depths uh, and you're exposed to the open ocean. So um, we go from lower diversity through a gradient back to lower diversity and high in the middle in this in the middle middle area. Okay, let's talk about the second type of reef, barrier reefs. Um, and these things, they kind of can go uh, sort of, they're sort of adjacent to fringing reefs. And like if the shoreline went like this and the, uh, and the reef kind of went like this, at this point where it joins up, there you would have a fringing reef, like sort of moving out to towards a barrier. And um, these can come over time as the, rubble depending on the the depth of the water outside the, the barrier reef but as the rubble sort of and the reef matures it can it can move offshore a bit um, and you'll see again this yellow part here which is the, the part that is built up by the coral that's all biogenic um, and the main difference between the fringing reef and the barrier reef is that there's this big lagoon here all right so um, yeah there are a lot of the a lot of the components of the the two reefs are, are very similar there's still a big four reef with the most diversity exposed to uh, great wave action and all that but this lagoon um, uh, it's exposed to a lot of sediments and as these waves especially if there's big wave action come across the, the reef, then what happens is a fair amount of sediment is washed back into the lagoon. 
and over here at the lagoon you'll see that um, so there's a fair amount of sediment sand it could be sand it could be um, depending on how much riverine input and all there is that can be muddy but generally like uh, usually fairly clear water and um, uh, it's with a, a soft sediment bottom now there can be these coral knolls or pinnacles or sometimes called bommies coral bomb like that can grow up in the lagoon and there are uh, some beautiful little patches to dive um, and uh, they're uh, very common in lagoons um, but then they tend to just be little patches and um, across the back reef you see like a decreasing amount of diversity uh, coming from this spot now these Lagoons are, are quite far from the uh, coming from the reef flat, the reef crest. The reef um, flat gives way to the back slope going down into the lagoon. Uh, the lagoons are very nice and calm, good um, good passageways for boats as long as you don't run into one of these coral bombies, uh, and they can be uh, quite. It can be you know tens of meters. Uh, well, more than that, a little bit, like um, in the oh, in the 20s, in 20, 30, 40 meters up to, uh, you know, like several hundred meters a kilometer, uh, kilometers wide, the lagoons. But um, they can be, there are uh, generally safe passages and good anchorages and things like that. Now, what happens is that there'll be a lot of wave action, especially you can see these waves here. And if they wash over the reef, what happens is there's a continual push of water coming in over the reef. And then that tends to move water uh, parallel to the shore through the lagoon. And usually there's a bit of a current. And then what happens is that uh, water will move back out through a passage. Uh, back out to the uh, open ocean so the water comes in uh, drives over the reef and then comes back out and so these places amazing places to surf and uh, swim and snorkel and all but you do have to worry uh, watch out if there's a heavy heavy um, uh, heavy swell running that you're gonna have a very strong current moving out through the passages which is which gives, means that there's going to be a lot of uh, soft coral and sea whips and sea fans and things like that in those places. But so they they get a, a, a separate kind of diversity. Um, on the we have the same kind of structure: the reef flat and the and the and the four reef slope. Uh, you can get these things called spur and groove formations because there's um, a lot of uh, rubble that kind of moves down. And sediment that gets washed down into these areas so there's a little bit of a kind of an erosion process going by they're usually not too too wide there's like if you're if they're exposed at low tide you could jump over them or if you're um, like at, at PNG when we're diving on the uh, you, you can dive about halfway around the island on one tank and then uh, what happens is you're you're out of uh, your tank's empty you might have done an hour and 45 minutes or something your tank is empty and you can come up these spur and grooves and go like right through into the lagoon where you can stand up and walk on the soft sediment trying not to walk too much on the coral whereas the in between the spur the uh, grooves then the spurs come right up to the to the surface so uh, you don't really want to be walking across those but you can swim up the up the grooves into the into the shallows and try to make your way back that way rather than swimming all the way back around the island um you'll see things like this the sand k which is out on this is the great barrier reef so uh you'll see these in commercials and things like that but this is all that biogenic um that sand that's been built up by the bio rotors like parrotfish and things like that and these things can be these beautiful little uh spots and if they are persistent enough then maybe they could get uh coconut trees or palm trees and things like that settling on them and um and become a little bit more uh, permanent um so they are uh, a common feature on uh, barrier reefs
again, we have, like, depending on how heavy the wave action, you're going to have your diversity, the highest, um, sort of in that mid-range depth on the, on the, on the uh, fore reef. And then as you lose the light, going to a lower diversity, and then a reasonably high diversity across the, the reef crest, and then lowering back down into the into the back reef slope. So the gradient is from the lagoon low up to a high diversity just below the reef crest on the fore reef and then back down to the um, lower as you lose light going down the fore reef slope. So let's move on to atolls. Okay, so these are um, amazing places out in the middle of nowhere. Uh, generally a, a sunken volcano and um, little ringlets of islands that are sometimes linked by causeways. Sometimes they'll have um, uh, little breaks in between them um, and they can be full circles or just like crescents or all sorts of things, but they're really just amazing places. Uh, and hopefully you'll get a chance to get out to places like this. They can be um, well populated like Kiribati, which has uh, amazingly 70,000 people living on it. And unfortunately, the, um, uh, the, the fact is that the, I think the highest place above sea level is about three, four meters there. So they're going to have to move. Uh, it's a pretty dire situation there. But I think you can get these uh, sand keys. Um, if the, they can be a little bit more permanent where you get um, a little islands and um, depending on how much uh, momentum there is or how much water movement there is through these uh, through the from the open ocean these lagoons can be freshwater um, and there may be a freshwater lens underneath these islands that um, that gives a uh, uh, an oasis for plants and people to to uh, live uh, so they can be big or small but amazing places <clears throat> so again you're, you're going to start to um, by this time understand a little bit of the same terminology the sand key uh, the reef flat um, back row reef inner slope again all this yellow is biogenic it's all derived from corals um, the pinnacles or bombies or uh, little isolated uh, point reefs can exist within the lagoon. Uh, again, sediment has probably been washed in to the lagoon, so you're going to have a soft sand, um, soft sand uh, bottom on the in the lagoon. Uh, that's from the wave action driving sediment into the lagoon, and um, there's generally very little uh, fresh water input, very little sedimentation uh, besides what's like the sand that's developed by the by all the bioerodors and the like. And so uh, usually very, very clean, clear water um, and amazing, uh, beautiful. They're generally divers paradises, really, these places. Um, often the they are located in areas where the trade winds are. So the wind is often in from one direction uh, most of the year. And so that can lead to a uh, difference in morphology between the uh, windward side and the, and the leeward side. Um, there's an algal ridge defined where you see here, uh, you see these heavy, where this on the heavier windward side, the heavier wave action, the bigger the spur and groove formations, although this says spar and groove, it should be spur and groove, but the, the spur and grooves are more defined where there's heavier wave action um, the, and less defined on the, wind, on the less windward side. Okay, um, yeah, so uh, these things will drop off into very, very deep water. So what happens is you do wind up with the highest diversity on the windward side, just below the um, where the wave action really impacts the 
uh, the coral, but there's still plenty of light and lots of rubble going down. So you're going to get out of the, like you're definitely on these fringing reefs, or sorry, as opposed to fringing or, or barrier reefs, you're going to get down into very deep water and lose your, um, your hermetific corals and get into big sponge gardens and all. And these are very low, little studied places in the three, 400 meter range where they're below di diving depth. But um, you transition from sponge garden to coral. So hundreds of years ago, thousands, thousands of two hundreds of years ago, people were sailing around and they're in the middle of the ocean, the open ocean and these just weird circles appear of, uh, of coral reefs and land and give them uh, safe places to rest and repair their boats and all. And nobody really knew where these things came from. They weren't land. They're just this crazy little string of coral reefs out in the middle of nowhere. Um, but Darwin was the first one that really cracked it in terms of figuring out how these things, these atolls, formed and if you look at the brown area here so this uh, the first part that's the land that's formed by a volcano so the volcano uh, because of tech um, tectonic activity that they're, they're gonna they're gonna be squeezing magma up through here and building this this volcano and then you get a fringing reef so very uh, the, the Coral larva settles and starts to grow on this area that's got plenty of light, and uh, we can see new islands forming even now from volcanic uh, eruptions just happening in the uh, around in the around the the Ring of Fire, and these things have roughed up. And if you want to study that, you can study the succession of coral forming onto the sides of these islands. Hawaii is very uh, a good place for that. It, um, they're quite old areas, but there's also a huge amount of volcanic activity. So what you find is that uh, rather than it being like a typical uh, coral atoll where it's all biogenic, there's just also been loads of lava rock just thrown and strewn amongst it. And then uh, lots of coral heads growing onto the lava rock. Great place to be. Um, but anyway, so the fringing reefs settle on, you know, and grow around the uh, volcano. And then through tectonic activity, as these things move away, and we'll look at this in the next slide, the uh, volcano will subside. And um, what happens is the, a barrier reef is formed with a lagoon around it. There still can be a, a good sized island in the middle. Um, of that, but then you get this lagoon around around the island, and then finally, as the volcano sinks and sinks away, the coral reef, uh, the is the coral biogenic coral material, which is all of this stuff, the growth of it at the edges is fast enough to keep up with the sinking rate of the volcano. And you just get a, a dome of biogenic material that keeps growing. And as long as the sinking rate of the volcano is faster, or sorry, is slower than the growth of the coral, then you should uh, always maintain the atoll uh, structure. So we're, we think of Darwin as uh, the guy that cracked evolution, but he was an amazing mind because uh, he didn't only crack evolution, but he cracked these um, atoll formations. And he understood um, that he'd read a few different books on uh, geology that had just come out and the idea of tectonic plates and um, and movement of, of the crust had was forming. And so he realized that um, the depth at these areas where there are volcanic uh, eruptions like the mid-atlantic ridge and all is quite a bit shallower because this is where the plates are uh, spreading apart and there's a lot of uh, 
push up from all of this stuff, uh, like all the magma the, uh, that's coming up, and that raises the the there's a, a ridge where the vol where these um, volcanoes are forming. But then the plate, so it, it's coming like this and spreading, and as the the volcano, which is now dormant, this one here, um, moves away from the, uh, the newly erupting areas and uh, other volcanoes are formed behind it, it goes into deeper and deeper water. And so what we have is the barrier reef, where you can see the atoll formation of, after a fringing reef is formed. Uh, well, this is a, or more of a barrier reef with the island still in the middle. And as it sinks away, then you've got your atoll. And then as that sinks further, as long as if it sinks faster than the coral reef can grow, then it becomes the seamount. And um, we can see great examples of this, like the Hawaiian Islands, where the islands uh, are in a chain and they go from um, uh, active volcanoes down to um, uh, out to the this long chain of smaller and smaller and deeper and deeper reefs. Uh, here's a little uh, terminology for you. So uh, the different types of fates that can happen to a a, uh, a volcano. So or a uh, yeah an ocean volcano. So when it first erupts, lots of uh, magma comes up, it forms, turns into land, uh, things settle on it on terrestrially and uh, uh, and below the, the surface. And um, it can have a fringing reef here. Um, it can become a sinking island, okay? And then that will have a, uh, a fringing reef or a barrier reef around it, a guillot. That's one that is um, a seamount with a flat top, and this is uh, could happen if it sinks faster than than the um, rate of growth of coral, uh, and then you can get one that's sinking slower than the fat the growth of coral. Right, you get a barrier reef around the sinking island, and finally an atoll. Uh, so we mentioned this before, Hawaii, um, the big island, Kilauea, you probably saw those um, amazing videos of rivers of lava a couple of years ago with uh, kilometers of, of new land forming, you know, like in, increasing the size of the island. But Hawaii is where the big island is, and this is where the volcanic fissures are from the, um, where the plates are coming, are um, spreading apart. And then as you go in this direction, this is the direction of the plate movement. And you can see that the islands, Maui, Molokai, Oahu, and then Kauai, and Nihau, are, um, they get smaller as they're, they're moving away. Uh, and there's a ridge of even smaller islands and seamounts that goes this direction as, um, as these things sink away. Uh, amazing place. All right, so we're going to move on from coral reef formation to zonation. Uh, we've already covered a little bit. We talked about it a bit, there, but it's uh, amazingly diverse and different from one part of the coral reef to the next. Um, uh, we've talked about how the diversity goes up and down depending on where you are. There's um, uh, very different creatures and um, and morphology of the corals and things that live there based on a lot of abiotic factors. Um, most of them, mostly, uh, they are light availability, wave action, uh, sediment load, great, um, temperature, salinity, and uh, then we get into the biotic factors of predation, human impacts, grazers, all of those things. So they all interact it's complex and all, and we're going to touch on each of those. Uh, you could study these for the rest of your life if you want to live around coral reefs and try to tease apart some of these relationships. So let's start by talking about places where there is a fair amount of uh, land with freshwater inputs and sediment 
And these areas often tend to get mangroves, especially in the tropics. We're at the southernmost uh, range of mangroves in the North Island here. Uh, but in the tropics, you get these uh, ones with these huge roots. Uh, often the tree will start to form like uh, it, the main body of the tree will start up in the air and then grow up from from there. And uh, you can go underneath the canopy and the mangroves and walk around on these roots and really feel like a monkey. Uh, there are places that um, where you know, there are monkey species that actually live only in mangrove areas. So um, they're often flooded by tide and provide a huge amount of species a, a refuge and uh, a nursery area and uh, so they go in here and they feed um, they can be uh, amazing places to snorkel or, or even dive at high tide and just see all the, all the incredible little juvenile fish and the like that are sheltering within the mangroves uh, often very uh, productive places for people to hunt for crabs and things like that but also um, great places for golf courses and hotels and things to be right on the on the shore of the lagoon and they've been removed in many many places and uh, during the boxing day tsunami places which retained their mangroves uh, fared much much worse or much much better than places where they'd been removed the death toll behind these things was uh, minimal compared to places where the death toll uh, where they're where the mangroves had been removed. So let's move out to the outer reef. Um, you can see that there's quite a different environment here than a sedimented area of uh, near shore where there are mangroves. Uh, we're gonna have some pretty heavy wave action. Uh, this is Chopu. Um, and uh, you get this massive amount of water, just these huge waves coming out of the deep ocean, draining away a pit into the um, like draining water off as the trough of the wave comes and then the the heavy wave comes in and you can imagine the uh, power and the um, and the amount of uh, turbulence that the organisms that are trying to survive in here have to have to put up with so uh, it's not every day that the waves are are like this some days it's very flat but um, occasionally these uh, these waves come in and they cause a fair amount of stress to the organisms living there. Um, very beautiful blue water, very clear, lots of light levels, no sedimentation, um, no sediment in the water, uh, and uh, so lots of um, uh, diversity with, you can see rich coral growth here, lots and lots of diversity. Uh, a lot of the, uh, the, for, the morphology, the shape of the corals will be um, impacted by ones that are more resistant to uh, wave action on the fore reef. Um, there'll be a, those spur and groove formations will come down in here and if um, well, let's say oh you can't really see any spur and groove formations in this one but if you see large spur and groove formations then you know you're going to be on the windward side where um, uh, the majority of the wave action is happening. So human impacts are one of the um, factors that uh, shape coral reefs. Uh, obviously coral reefs didn't um, evolve over the last millions of years with humans uh, um, impacting them. You can see blast fishing here on the reef flat uh, which very um, haphazard how these uh, human impacts happen but because there are so many humans they can uh, create a lot of changes to reefs and shape their morphology now we um study human impacts generally as um, rather than shaping how the reef works as a um, as with humans as an as a component we often look at the um, human impacts as how they're changing what would otherwise be uh, in an unimpacted environment. But in fact, um, 
we probably start need to start thinking about humans as a regular uh, factor, a regular uh, part of coral reef development. The issue is that the uh, human impacts are so myriad that it's going to it's very difficult to um, um, and that they're they're just going to be so different from one place to the, to the next. They're so diverse that it's uh, almost case by case study. So light levels are one of the most important factors for coral growth. Um, the deeper you go, this one's uh, this picture you can see has got a, a flash photography on it and quite dark in the background. As you go deeper, of course, there's going to be less light, and uh, so of course you're going to see differences in structure of the coral based on light availability. And why is that? Obviously, as you review, you're going to be taught or you're going to remember that zooxanthellae um, are um, the sort of second powerhouse of the of the um, coral polyps in terms of generating energy. Uh, you're going to lose as you as you lose light. You're what you're not what you're doing essentially is changing the wavelength uh, proportionality. So you're getting you're losing less of the or you're getting less reds and more blues as you go deeper. And different zooxanthellae will be adapted. Uh, to specialize in uh, gathering those particular uh, light wavelengths. And so, of course, you're going to see a difference in coloration and, um, and uh, shape as the corals grow to maximize their ability to take advantage of that sunlight or move into more, uh, less of a, a zooxanthellae um, powered uh, where they get more of their, um, they'll get more of their energy from capturing uh, prey with their tentacles rather than from their zooxanthellae uh, to the maximize that balance. Diseases of corals can be a factor. Um, corals have uh, evolved for millions of years with disease as a component, and so it's not. It can be exacerbated by uh, human uh, influence. But it is not a uh, a new phenomena since humans have, have been around, and some of these diseases can be uh, prevalent. They can go through and wipe out uh, big swaths of coral, and then that can influence what settles. Uh, for a time, you'll get a lot of uh, algal growth on the dead coral, and um, before the uh, coral can has a, have a, a chance to compete against that algae again, as it as new corals settle, but uh, disease can be a component in shaping a coral reef. Um, in some areas, you don't think of the tropics as uh, being ex uh, extremely seasonal, but seasonality can make a big difference in terms of uh, shaping the coral reef. Some, some of them will have uh, very, very high freshwater inputs for certain times of the year. There'll be um, one time portion of the year where it's very stormy, and uh, from one direction or long, lots of uh, swell from one direction, and then that swell drops off for another type of time of year. So um, depending on whether there's a steady state sort of trade wind uh, area um, or the, you, get, um, uh, you get variability in terms of the environmental conditions from year to year, that can change the morphology of a, uh, of a coral system. Uh, so storm impact, uh, wave impact, and especially uh, uh, large storm events can have a huge Im uh, impact on shaping the uh, coral reef structure. Um, you can see storm damage here where these Elkhorn corals are just in a, in a jumble. Um, so they've been uh, broken off and uh, uh, they can rebuild themselves as a giant jumble. There was, uh, when I was in Tahiti in 2000, nine, I believe, or 10, there had been um, a huge outbreak of crown of thorn starfish that had weakened the uh, reef system. And then a, a, a large cyclone came down from the, the big cyclone came down from the north and on the north slope of the, uh, the whole island of Moria, they, um, the the coral had been sort of reduced to a, almost like a flat rubble. 
it had been weakened by the crown of thorns and then the cyclone had come in and given it the the death punch the old one two but uh that was a couple of years beforehand and what was amazing was how healthy the coral the reef looked because everywhere you looked there were sort of cabbage size um corals that had uh they were new colonies and uh they just carpeted the the floor of the of the um coral reef and you could see that it was growing back it was recovering but for that time the um the storm events uh and as they get uh, more as we get more storm events if uh, global warming increases temperature uh, as we get greater and and stronger storms that is going to have an impact on uh, the ability of the reefs to recover and uh, the shape of the corals that will that will ultimately be successful in those areas so we don't have to say too much about this one this is uh sedimentation um corals uh like a lot of light they don't like to be smothered uh, they get uh, uh they they tend to decline very quickly with sedimentation this is a, a big storm event in fiji and uh this area which would normally be bright blue water um has uh obviously got a lot of riverine input and that can that can uh change whether corals exist in that area or how many corals and uh especially if we get uh this is more of a human impact because without the logging and the um, farming there probably wouldn't be as much of the sedimentation but sedimentation uh will affect um where corals uh, exist if you go to brazil around the um uh the where the um, amazon river comes out uh, there's a huge amount of sedimentation coming down that river and even though the water temperature is fine for corals there's a very few isolated patch reefs where corals exist i'm not sure if you'll recognize this but um probably it'll make sense it's coral bleaching and these ones you've uh, been exposed to in the past so xanthelli being expelled from um coral polyps while when the temperature gets warm so uh temperature especially up in those reef flats and uh the lagoon and back reef where the, um there's a lot of exposure to light and um extremes from the daytime to nighttime that temperature can play a big factor in zonation of coral reefs hopefully you're getting the idea now that they're um large complex lots of different um habitats within coral reefs and the zonation can be difficult to describe there's a lot of um variation depending on the environmental conditions but water motion like the wave action and light penetration are probably the most important physical factors so we said that wave action is the uh was one of the predominant factors and so if you've got a prevailing wind that's going to be a very very strong uh shape shaper of coral atoll and um also barrier reefs and so we've discussed a lot of this the uh corals are few and uh more delicate at 50 meters and up at 15 meters or so there's uh they're very resilient to high wave action and um with these large spurs that um that come down from the algal ridge and here's an example of a strong prevailing trade winds but this is what we see sometimes they're called buttresses uh, but these spurs these uh, grooves they're very important um their surge channels is another word for them they uh uh, water will come in and spill off of these things you'll even get the the same analog down at uh say uh, the beach at the uh at the mount you'll see sort of uh areas like on the beach where they're where the sand has these high points and things like that so you get um naturally uh occurring bits where the water will come up onto these high points and then spill down and so with all this wave action you can imagine that corals are getting broken and things like that and 
uh, so set, this is a um, quite a, a transporter of sediment. And sediment can be a, um, not just sand and that kind of thing, but can be large chunks of broken coral. And they can be uh, washed down through these algal ridges down to the, um, or sorry, these, uh, these um, search channels down to the deeper reef. Here's a nice picture taken by uh, our, our ex-staff member Keith um, from northern Madagascar, this uh, marine reserve way up at the northern tip. And you can see a lot of the um, the diversity of the algal, or sorry, the diversity of the coral reef just uh, even in uh, such a small area. So uh, let's say that uh, we'll use this color. So you'll get uh, algal areas growth up in here and the uh, the reef flats um, with a little more uh, estuarine or water inputs, like freshwater inputs and less growing. And then uh, you get these channels, this fringing reef and out to out to the deeper areas here. You can snorkel around and see an amazing amount of diversity just within a very small area. So like we were saying, these things are very complex. So in general, if we're talking about... Um, uh, doing like a transect across an atoll, uh, there's, there's endless variety, but um, uh, you're going to see, that, and it depends on the morphology of the island, of the volcano or whatever that was the underlying substrate before, but generally you're going to see a little bit longer and um, uh, larger uh, growth on the windward side and then a steeper drop off on the leeward side, which has to do with a lot of the... Um, a push of the waves, accreting material up into the in, where it um, uh, collects a little bit more on this on the windward side. Uh, we'll have a look. At, there's uh, at a few of the um, uh, look in a little bit more detail, but this is a, a kind of a general rule. You're going to get thicker, uh, the more buttressed areas, the more um, spur and groove areas on the windward side. And if we look at the coral types, you can see that light, of course, plays a, uh, a big factor in this. But um, this is more of the, re the uh, wave action that is going to um, uh, influence the, the um, morphology of the corals. So down in the deep at the um, at the fore reef, then you can get large corals, big like massive corals where they get very big. They're competing for light. They're not um, subject to as much uh, wave uh, uh, energy, and so they can get quite large. They get um, uh, big branches, that kind of thing. And then as you go up, you get a diminishing size and heavier body so heavy branching corals out here on the reef crest which they look like they'd be fairly fragile but at the same time those alcorn corals and things like that they're very hydrodynamically um, uh, resilient in that they can shed even quite a lot of wave energy but then once you get up into the the, the top the reef crest you'll get uh reef flats like these very small um not very branching but um uh, globose kind of corals that um, can take a lot of pounding and a lot of algae uh, because the algae will grow um, very quickly uh, in fact quicker than a, a, a um, coral can um, in between storm events but the the corals that do grow are, are um, flat and resilient and then we get into the uh, pools and channels and you get uh, small corals but um, high degree of structure okay so lots of branches lots of uh, a lot of variety um, uh, you know a lot of diversity in the just after the reef crest and then the reef flat less diversity because um, there's no um, there's no wave action that's uh, beating them up there's a little bit more current with the waves sort of spilling over and uh, creating a little bit, keeping a uh, temperature buffer here, but we start to get a uh, high temperature and plenty of light, but um, and then 
you start getting into where there's awesome often freshwater influence and so um, at the beach there's a freshwater lens that often collects uh, as it um, as the rain falls and it soaks in here before it before it it uh, uh, transpires out into the into the um, you know, it just runs out into the to merge with the ocean water it's kind of a lens of fresh water that's seeping out and keeping this area um, let more free from corals and this is where you get sea sea grasses and things yeah so another example of it we kind of like for you to understand the um, uh, influence of um, where the uh, of the waves and general structure of the corals not the particular species and not particular uh, branching pat uh, like not exactly species or anything like that but general the general branching patterns and the general size of the corals in the fore reef to the um, to the lagoon all right here's a nice image of a seagrass bed another picture from Keith and this um, you'll find the temperatures go really high up when, especially when this is at low tide but when high tide is in or as it's coming in and out you'll see little sharks um, hunting in through here uh, black tip sharks with their with their fins sticking right out of the water and um, um, but uh, quite a lot of uh, tangs and butterfly fish and things like that cruising around in here and just tiny small clusters of, of um, corals but uh, it becomes uh, very hot at, at times and really uh, uh, too hot for the, a lot of corals to survive. So this is a good uh, slide for you to review. We're not going to go over all this wordiness. Um, I think at this point it's um, it's time that you actually get to a coral area and start having a look. Um, we've talked about the fore reef. We've talked about the uh, reef slope. We've talked about the algal ridge. Up at the top and going and uh, the back slope down into the um, into the uh, the lagoon and uh, the halamita or seagrass on the, um, algae growing in, in that area that's a little more resilient to fresh water. We've had a, a couple of um, zonation images. We're just going to quickly talk touch on micro atolls. And there's a uh, quite a large one. This is a more of a cenote, a, um, a freshwater sinkhole that is created a little micro atoll on a barrier reef in Belize, the Great Blue Hole in Belize, which is uh, one of the largest. There are a few of these blue holes, but this one, uh, the Belize Barrier Reef, is the largest in the Caribbean. I think maybe even the second largest behind. Uh, behind the Great Barrier Reef in Australia, but I could have that wrong. But you'll actually find these little tiny micro atolls as well on uh, on reef flats. And uh, they're funny little things, but um, they almost have like a little lagoon inside the inside the middle of them. And um, they can be prevalent features with uh, a little bit of micro zonation going on as well. Um, so if we go from the for reef the leeward or the uh, windward side to the leeward side um, it's going to be generally a little narrower than the seaward and um, there's a barren there's usually a barren boulder zone okay so there's not a lot of uh, algal ridge because there's not so much and or as many surge channels because the uh, the waves aren't as large and they don't uh, come in and pound the top of the reef as much so uh, that means that the uh, corals there can grow um, with a little less uh, disturbance and uh, tend to outcompete the, the algae um, and so we finally come to this uh, great diagram which puts it all together so um, if you're looking at the um, uh, where the waves are coming in um, you see the uh, fore reef 
of the waves coming in like so. And uh, this is where the uh, this is the prevailing wind and waves. You can see that the wave stress is very high from here and decreases down. You can see the exposure. Uh, this is um, uh, sunlight and or this is uh, sorry, yeah, this is uh, sunlight exposure. And we'll see where the diversity gets highest, uh, where there's a bit of wave stress uh, but less. Uh, exposure to to sun light where it's uh, without much uh, without the water uh, coming in and, and like the ocean water coming in and um, keeping the the temperature the same and then uh, diversity will drop off as the wave influence um, gets strong but then we see the opposite where the diversity is low up here because of the wave influence uh, and then there are less uh, corals that can um, uh, handle that wave stress, and here's our wave stress. Uh, then you get a much higher diversity after when you drop off of the the wave stress down to where you lose your sunlight. So the light exposure is plenty, and then drops quickly. Um, and then on the back reef, okay, uh, going into the lagoon, uh, again you have the same thing um, where you have high diversity. And but you're not really uh, subject to too much wave exposure. You get to the point where there's um, desiccation from uh, tidal uh, tidal influence and uh, drying out, and then you start to get to sediment stress. And um, so you can also see the uh, types of corals that you'd expect to to see the branching and the size both um, and these give you a really good uh, um, idea of gradients of exposure so this is a great uh, diagram that is sort of a meta uh, analysis a sort of meta uh, overview of what you should expect to find and of course the, with any reef that you go to you're going to find some exceptional So if you look at a reef like this again, um, as we did at the beginning, you'll, you can start to see uh, different things like the, um, the four reef channels and, the, uh, and a little bit of the zonation and the flats, and you'll have a bit more of an uh, appreciation for it. So your mission is now to stop this, um, this video and uh, describe the zones and uh, including the physical features of the coral, and what you might expect to find as you move from the uh, across the transect line from one part of the island to the next. Okay, and finally, we're just going to touch on the um, the abiotic factors a little bit more, or sorry, the biotic factors a little bit more. Uh, but we're not really going to uh, describe too much of it. Uh, essentially, they're so variable and so um, difficult to predict uh, the community structure out of these things because there's um, depending on what species are there that's going to change the uh, predation the, um, rates and the uh, type of uh, interactions grazing all of this kind of thing and um, the uh, diversity of these um, of the creatures on it are all are going to be so variable from one to the next that uh, it really is a case-by-case -case basis. Of course, the biotic factors are going to be very important uh, within the coral reef um, structure, and we'll talk. You will learn a little bit more about that throughout the course. There's a nice uh, diagram to sort of explain a little bit about um, some of the the uh, web of interaction between the different uh, trophic levels and you can see that it is very complicated but uh, I advise you to stop and have a look at some of these and just um, contemplate some of these and uh, try to get to know this because as you go and dive on these on these reefs then that's where the um, all of this preparation really starts to become interesting and the more you know before you go the more you're going to get out of the diving and the snorkeling so 
there is succession and some stability. There used to be a thing called um, Apex uh, Communities uh, that is a concept that has been kind of shed by ecologists. We don't really talk about uh, Apex Communities anymore. About 35 years ago, there used to be a lot of uh, if you looked at the literature, you'd see Apex Community uh, written quite often, now almost never, because it's considered that there's always disturbance and um, uh, it's that the, there is so much variety, even within something like a tundra environment or a uh, um, uh, almost what you would consider a monoculture of pines or things like that in uh, up in the environments like that, uh, deep deep ocean, um, where there's still considered to be enough disturbance that there is no such thing as an apex community. Only uh, communities within that are in succession, and reefs uh, are the same. They can be stable over short time frames, but once there are, there are always going to be catastrophic destruction. Uh, catastrophic destruction events like storms, crown of thorns, outbreaks, El Nino, heat, um, uh, temperature raises, uh, human mediated problems, disease, disturbance, and often multiple stressors. These things are acting in uh, synergy. So just like most things in the, uh, in the environment, most uh, communities within the environment, if you just leave them alone, um, they can recover within 25 to 30 years, but um, that's a long time, and humans are not so good at letting things lie for that long. Uh, so, yeah, they, um, they have a, an amazing resiliency, uh, but um, as I was, as I saw in Tahiti, but um, uh, they, it does take time. Okay, so that is it for this lecture, and I hope you um, now understand a little bit about the uh, formation and succession, the abiotic and biotic factors that create reefs and what you'd expect to see around any type of environment where uh, reef building corals will exist.